Hello there, my fellow Imperial soldiers, and welcome back to another lore video on the universe of Dune. With the unfortunate news that the new Dune movie is now delayed almost a year, hopefully this video and the ones coming after it are gonna be a good thing for you to watch. Now, last week we introduced the famous and dreaded Sardukar soldiers, and talked about where they came from, their customs and their training. Today we're gonna continue learning about them, this time with some of their history, military and otherwise. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Right before the famous Battle of Corin, the Sardukar were being used as mercenaries by another house called Megara, or Megara if you will. This was not a very good decision on part of House Megara, because it would trigger a chain of events that brought the prominence of the Sardukar into being. After they conquered Megara, the Sardukar rejoiced at the chance to leave Salusa Secundus in force, with an energy and a gusto that put to shame even the most fanatical of the Butlerians. Using captured vessels, the Sardukar seized the white sector in the vicinity of Megara. Space travel was so slow after the Jihad that the Sardukar's so-called Meteor Strike still gave the Landrod time enough to prepare, at least partially, for the threat coming towards them. The Landrod saw them coming and anticipated them as a threat, and this would result in the Battle of Corin. The Battle of Corin would be a tactical victory for the Sardukar, but at the same time a strategic stalemate. It would cow the great houses, and thereby prevent another immediate confrontation. But the message of the Landsrad was clear nevertheless. Either come to the negotiating table, or keep on fighting and probably lose. The Sardukar could win an extended war, but their empire afterwards would be a ruin. The Burseg, the leader of the Sardukar, did see the wisdom of compromise. And with the Treaty of Corin, he became the first of the Padishah Emperors, taking the name of Shoset Kostin I. During the first years of his reign, he consolidated his power with expansionistic campaigns, into which he would channel the battle lust and the power of his soldiers. Some recalcitrant Landrat houses refused to sign the treaty though. These were some independent planetary rulers who denied that they were bound to it. If either kind of holdout could not be persuaded to accept the new order of things, he or she would inevitably have to deal with the mighty Sardukar. One such example is House Jansen, who refused to sign and prepared itself for a siege. Jansen was a planet with a thriving agriculture and a light industry, and they thought they were ready for a long defense. Expecting the so-called meteor strike of the Sardukar coming from the skies, which had marked many of their previous campaigns, the people of Jansen instead suffered the so-called meteor shower, which was the infiltration of a small number of troops across the face of the planet. This was a rather new tactic which won the order of victory for its inventor, a man called Wei Forold, because, to begin with, his strategically placed guerrilla teams would paralyze communication and transportation. When that was done, they would storm military barracks, assassinate or capture high military and civilian leaders, and all of that just in a few days. The final assault would come on a demoralized and isolated Jansen capital with no proper defenders. Many years later, the foolishness of actually waiting for the Sardukar to come to you would not be lost on the houses that joined the Lishash Confederation in the rebellion of 385 AG. This happened several centuries after the foundation of Chome, with certain houses taking exception to the Padishah supremacy and a proposed division of shares increasing the votes of the Emperor on the Chome board from 20% to 21%. In this event, the Lishasha saw creeping monopoly on part of the Emperor and wanted to defy it. Other houses would share this view and they would become allies. 
The LC announced its formation with a surprise attack on Sardukar forts and outposts within what was now claimed sovereign territory of the Lishash Confederation. The preparations for this attack were long in the making. The strategy used rehearsed, the infantry trained and coordinated, fleets of assault vessels stealthily prepared. The initial outcome was successful. The forces of the LC achieved most of their main objectives, but only with a very high number of losses. The besieged Sardukar would launch parties of their own to bleed and tie down the attackers. Nevertheless, the forces of the LC did somehow manage to capture several Sardukar officers alive, a feat which at the time was nigh on unheard of. When the LC staff offered them as hostages, the regent Henley replied, let them drink blood. This was a cryptic answer that the LC did not understand, but the Sardukar did. Some of them would tear out their own throats with their fingernails, but many of them died attacking their captors with their bare hands. Henley would then gather a great fleet of Landsrad armies spearheaded by Sardukar shock units. The Sardukar were to recapture the forts and the outposts that were conquered, with the armies of the Landsrad to invade the other LC planets. The Regent Henley would make a bloody example of many of those planets. The Sardukar would retake all their bastions and not take any prisoner. They would then attack the planets of Lishash and their allies from widely separated directions. The speed and ferocity of these combined attacks would rout the LC armies. Lishash was the first planet to fall. Their major cities were burned, their rulers executed in public, and their citizens indiscriminately butchered. Seeing all this devastation, the allies of the LC would sue for mercy, in the beginning without success. One by one, they were getting trampled by the Sardukar. But then, a Landsra general called Tomig, sickened by all this carnage he was observing, objected to the regent and his orders. And with that, Tomig returned to the Landsrad and disbanded the Landsrad army. True to the quick-witted nature of the Sardukar, Henley did not try to force his orders. Many observers believe that he welcomed the protest of Tomig. Caught between the Landsrad and the Lion, he had to satisfy both. Without the armies of the Landsrad, he could end hostilities and then blame the concession on the Landsrad. Tomig would be satisfied, the Sardukar would be satisfied, and the supremacy of the Corinos was upheld without more massacres. And thus, at the end of the day, Lishash was devastated, but many of their allies survived to see another day. The Landsrad itself, on a more general basis, welcomed the Sardukar because the Imperial troops allowed the Great Houses to expand without any disturbance from their rivals. Warfare among the Landsrad members was regulated by the Great Convention, and the regulations were, in turn, enforced by the Sardukar. And so, they expanded, at the expense of peripheral planets, which sometimes didn't even know about the Imperium until someone told them that a great house was on their way to invade them. Similar expansions by the Corinos became the relief valve for the Sardukar. It would bring economic benefit, would keep the Sardukar battle ready, and sated any military desire for action, as opposed to plotting and scheming at a court. A few other notable actions and events that the Sardukar took part in include In 445 AG, Saudir IV organized the revolt of the provincial Sardukar and took the throne in a brief battle that deposed and exiled Shoset II. Bashar Fate I, during a rupture within the Sardukar, was elected to the imperial throne in 1027 AG. Sardukar rebel factions would join Demetrios IX Atreides and Paulos II Atreides, who tried organizing a resistance to his rule. If you want to know how that ended up, do watch my House Atreides history video. Sardukar commander Harmhab would murder Emperor Basil III in 2391 AG and usurp the throne, claiming the title Harmhab Menemtahe VI. Atreus Atreides, a descendant of Estil I, 
would rally the Sardaukar around his cause and mount a coup d'etat in early 4555 AG, proclaiming himself as emperor. As millennium after millennium passed, the lowly origin of the Sardaukar as a cattle-herding tribe on an infertile jungle planet was all but forgotten. Salusa Sikandas became famous as the prison planet of the emperor, not the world from which the Sardaukar had escaped at the first available opportunity. However, if you are more poetically inclined, you could say that both the planet and the tribe deserved each other. And after 87 centuries after their separation, they would be reunited, under the orders of Emperor Muad'Dib. As the Sardaukar were a key element in maintaining the imperial hegemony of the Korinos, by the time of Emperor Shaddam Korino IV, the guy ruling in the present-day story of Dune, they had become overconfident and arrogant. The mystique of their warrior religion had been deeply undermined by cynicism. The decline of the Sardukar was attributed to three major factors, also set during the reign of Shaddam IV. First, the increase in the rank of Burseg had swelled, making the Sardukar corps very heavy with officers. Secondly, the events that occurred during the Great Spice War had created a deep undercurrent of resentment against both the Sardukar and the Emperor. Shaddam ordered the Sardukar to commit some terrible atrocities. They took part in the infamous massacre of civilians on Zanover, coupled with the destruction of Corona, no pun intended, which was an artificial moon of the planet Richesi, both these actions sparked a lot of outrage across the cosmos. The third element was the betrayal of the Sardukar against the Emperor in favor of the renegade Leilaxu, Haidar Fen Ajidika, during the occupation of the world of Ix. There, the Sardukar, led by Zum Garan's own son, Kando Garan, although blinded by the synthetic spice melange, actually followed the orders of Atleilaxu rather than House Corino. This would lead to the defeat of the Sardukar on Ix by an Atreides army and the remnants of another house called Vernius. During the Fremen uprising on Arrakis, the Sardukar suffered another devastating blow, which would see Paul Atreides elevated to the rank of Emperor of the known universe. Subsequently, the Sardukar would become a marginal force, continuing to act as the army and guardians of House Corino, although deliberately avoiding any conflict with the OP Fremen warriors. When House Corino fell as a ruling power, they were allowed to maintain one Imperial Standard Legion on Salusa Secundus. This was about 30,000 men. The Sardaukar ceased to exist as a viable entity after Farad and Corino became the concubine of Ganima Atreides, when Leto II ascended to the imperial throne, eventually becoming what was called the God Emperor. And all of this, my friends, is what I wanted to tell you about most of Sardaukar history for today. Quite ironically, for a faction that is so famous in-universe, and also an influential factor in developing many other sci-fi settings, the actual lore on the Sardaukar is not that rich, unfortunately. Equally ironically, there's probably some individual Space Marine chapters in 40k with a lot more lore on them than the entirety of the Sardaukar. I might also make a third and final video on them, so do stay tuned. Do share any thoughts or questions if you have any on this topic in the comments below if you want. If you found the episode entertaining or informative, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks a lot for watching to the end and may the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.